We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Welcome to another episode of the Darkened Hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. Special guest with me today is my co-host for the Darkened Hour, Richard Cox. Richard, hey, this is a new one. Thanks for joining me. Good evening, Adam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, hey, Rich. Well, Richard Cox is obviously my co-host for the Darkened Hour. He has his own website, which deals with spirituality, conspiracy theories, anarchism, and geopolitics. He has also authored his first book entitled Contemplating Conspiracy, Excursions into Undiluted Madness, to which the basis of the interview is surrounding on. And why don't we open up with the first question, Richard? Um, I read the book. It's 80 pages long. I'm going to link that at the bottom of the description uh, in the uh, podcast. Um, but in the very first chapter, you mentioned that you were not experienced with the nature of conspiracy theories initially. Um, was your skeptical nature toward conspiracy theorists based on your misunderstanding of them or a misunderstanding of just how nefarious certain elements of government or was it a combination of both? Well, mostly I was young. Okay. And you grow up in a system and you believe what the system has to say. And for me, I think a big part of it was I became increasingly dead disenfranchised with the educational system as I got older. And I, I went into it wide eyed and thinking it's going to be some wonderful experience. And it's all about learning. And, you know, we're, we're, this is the descendancy of Plato's Academy kind of thinking. And then realizing it wasn't that at all, you know, and this increasing cynicism about what we were doing there and how it really was a whole box ticking exercise. And around that time, George W. Bush, so I'm 18 when George W. Bush gets elected president. And that's one of many things that just seemed, struck me as really odd that in a nation of 300 million people, what are the chances that the son of the guy who did the job, but one before would be, would, would get it, you know, that, that just seems statistically unlikely, unless the Bushes are some sort of politically genius family and they're just a cut above the average American. Um, well, that didn't seem to be the case. So my, my general faith in the world broke down at the same time, you mentioned the, the podcast deals with spirituality and I was opening up to, um, sort of, I went through a very standard kind of thing of being raised inside a, a Christian, um, culture really inculturated into Christianity and sent to Sunday school and then rejecting that as a bunch of fairy tales around the age of 11 or so and embracing a more kind of scientific materialist worldview and then finding that to be very empty of meaning and then moving into an embrace when I, when I discovered it of, of more kind of Eastern philosophy, Eastern spirituality, which is just like everything I've just said in the last two minutes is like a thousand million people say that around the world. It's a very standard journey people go on. And that, that also had this jolting effect of like, oh, the world's really different to the way we think it is in a positive way. In some ways it's much better. You know, a lot of this spiritual stuff has value and merit. It's not just uh, flim flam fantasies uh, necessarily. And then equally um, discovering that the world is much deeper and darker too, in some ways. And that, that was my exposure to conspiracy was picking up by David Icke then when I was 18 and, um, I, I suppose my only reticence about conspiracy theories, I assumed they weren't true. Like the ones I'd heard would be Kennedy and the moon landing. And that was kind of it. Then people didn't talk about conspiracy theory in the nineties. I don't think as much at all as now. And I just thought, well, look, if that, if some nefarious cabal shot Kennedy, then that would, the U S government would come screeching to a halt. You couldn't have another election again until that was all sorted out and the media would be all over it. So clearly this is just some people with fertile imaginations, isn't it? And, and that, that was it. That's all I thought about it. And then, 
being plunged into that world and finding out that a lot of these claims had merit, you know, like the CIA does traffic drugs and that kind of thing. And we do live in imperial constructs. So that that's what really got me wrestling then, because obviously you're on a spectrum then, which is like from the normie kind of side of things to the very extreme fringe kind of side of things. And I, I'm questioning then, where am I going to end up on this spectrum? What, what is truth here? Can I discern it? I probably, probably said enough there for you, your question, Adam. So I'll, I'll turn it back over. Yeah, no, um, I'm interested in this because uh, in, during my young adult years, um, I was imbued with human constructs. Uh, when I talk about human constructs, I'm talking about like politics, racism, religion, all the, uh, the human applications, the catchisms, if you will. Um, did you have any uh, um, human influences that made you perceive the reality before you in a, in a different light back then than as, as opposed to now? No, not on the political level, really. No, it was more that I found out the world wasn't as it was supposed to be. And then I think it was literally just that David Icke's book was in the spirituality section of the bookshop. And I was looking there and it's called The Biggest Secret, right? That was his new-ish book at the time. I was like, oh, what's The Biggest Secret? Is there something else I don't know about the world? And to me, it was kind of a mental experiment because I just on a, an, an A level, like a, a leaving school certificate in history. And we were sat there being given these documents that were apparently from the 17th century. And I'm thinking like, you know, how do we know this happened, right? And I'm sure we do. Right? I'm sure that people at universities have very good reason, but we don't know, like in this class, we're just handed these documents and told, yeah, this is what happens. So what if you carry on up and like you do an undergraduate degree and, and they don't know and so on. So to me, it was an a conspiracy theory came across as an interesting intellectual proposition immediately, like a, a kind of like pluralism, although I wouldn't have had the language for it at the time. Say, so, well, what is an alternative worldview to compare it to? Like, can you construct? an alternative theory of history. And I think I've, I've always had an innate interest in iconoclastic figures that say, oh, look, we could look at this whole thing completely different, whether it's in, um, whether it's in history or science or anything. The, like, because how can somebody construct a, an ideology that's different from the mainstream and believe in that, given all the pressure that they're going to be under to conform? I think that's always interesting to me. So that, that was really how it started. And then um, just finding the level of truth contained within it sort of pulled me in further. Okay, this really has to be taken seriously. You, you open up the book with a quote from um, uh, Paul Firebend. Yeah. Uh, in which you quoted, even our most basic assumptions, our most solid beliefs, and our most conclusive arguments can be changed, improved, or diffused, or shown to be irrelevant by a comparison with what at first looks like undiluted madness. Yes. Is that something that resonated with you at the time or more so now after uh, writing this book? Well, no, for, I, I actually started studying Fire Armed about 15 years ago um, and it didn't resonate with me so much up until that point, okay? Because like a lot of people, I would have thought that the way you understand the world is you get the right idea and you just go down that one track and you don't consider flim flammy ideas off to the side okay but the undiluted madness thing i, I ultimately made it the the subtitle um so on one level looking at the title you might think oh okay conspiracy theories are undiluted madness and the book is about engaging with them and that's not quite what i meant that's a kind of superficial and ultimately untrue level the undiluted madness is other people's opinions that are different from your own other people's worldviews like when you don't stand and look on the landscape from the same position as another person, what they say appears as undiluted madness because they're looking in a different direction. So the excursion into undiluted madness is an invitation to join the other person in their perspective of the world. And that can be um, an excursion for the, the normie to say, okay, well, why do these people think the towers are brought down by explosives? Why, why do the people have, get involved in this QAnon stuff or, or whatever it is? And to turn and say, okay, I, I can see how a person with a similar starting point to me, you could go on a different journey and rationally end up there. And equally for the conspiracy theorists to not necessarily reject, you know, all mainstream opinion and all the work of uh, journalists who are a little more uh, centric in their, in their views. It's an invitation for us all to embrace that which we are not. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, in the, throughout the book, you, you know, you took great care to mention your introduction into David Icke. 
mm. and how his views toward materialism and conspiracy influenced you. Um, and to, then too much later, 9-11 happened, which led you to question yeah. the narrative. But how, how deeply rooted were you in the nature of conspiracy as opposed to conventional uh, mainstream ideas? Or were you in the midst of conflict on believing through empirism and faith? Um, for me, it was all conflict, really, at that point, because I could... Just taking, for example, fluoride, right? So we, we talked about fluoride in the biology class at school. And you are presented with that there are two sides to that argument. There's people who want fluoride in the water supply because it's good for your teeth. And then there's people that don't because they consider it some sort of civil liberties issue. But it was never suggested, never suggested that the people that don't might actually think it's toxic beyond a certain dose. Okay. So straight away, I could see there was a lie told in a lie of admission told in the educational system. Okay. And David Icke saying, yeah, fluoride's toxic. Now, I don't know if it's toxic initially at that point i don't really have an opinion on it but i know i've been lied to and i know that oh, okay people aren't just opposed to this because of some abstract issue of civil rights okay um so for me i just didn't know but what, what as i stepped into it some of the outlandish claims they seem to have merit okay and this isn't this isn't 2020 this is 2001 where you can't just go on the internet and easily check these things i wouldn't have had the resources to anyway and for me there was a prolonged period of floundering about really and not knowing um what was crazy and what wasn't because david ike shape-shifting reptilians might be kind of on the crazy fringe but to me the idea that the cia traffic drugs is on the crazy fringe i mean that that was the most radical and ludicrous thing at all but it was also one of the things that i could at, even at that time like verify okay yeah there's, they do have quite a close relationship to and that's like a totally different idea of how like the good guys and the bad guys were positioned so for me there was a long period of floundering i ultimately stepped back from it for a while and then um looked more at philosophy and then when i came back in i took more of a geopolitical angle to try and get like okay what can be firmly established what can we say absent speculation and then have that as a foundation to speculate should we want to Uh, I just want to follow up on that, if I may. You, uh, I think you mentioned previously, it could uh, follow up on this, that conspiracy theories were much more abundant in the past than they are now with the advent of the internet. Would that be a true statement or? No, I think the other way around, Adam. Conspiracy theories are much more abundant now much than in the past. Now. I, I would think so. It's just, I mean, look, I was, a, I was a kid in the 90s, right? But I just, we never encountered them, right? It just seems to be very much. I mean, 9-11 obviously massively in, increased the, the talk around them. And I think the possibility to consume information through documentaries, because it's a more, uh, it's a it's sort of easier medium than reading big, thick books sometimes. Um, but it just, it seems to me that the internet has created really proliferation. So probably all sorts of worldviews are more prominent now than in the past. And there has been a certain fracturing and people can go down uh, all sorts of different avenues and find communities to do that with, where it is in the past, it would have been much harder to find anyone. To, I mean, if you're into conspiracy, if I've been into conspiracies in the nineties, I could probably find some random guy down the pub sometimes to chat to, but that would have been it. You know, I'd have had to have traveled hundreds of miles to a conference to, and indeed in the early days, I went to things like the Nexus conference, right? And uh, Nexus New Times magazine from Australia. And that would be like my one conversation about conspiracy theory for months or maybe to the next year's conference. Because it's not like you can pop on the internet and talk to people. Well, I mean, so stick on the 9 11 theory, because in chapter three, you illuminate just how important World Trade Center Tower number seven is to conspiracy theorists in the 9 11 truth movement. And I, I do remember our first interview with David Chandler regarding mm. how he thinks the building came down by pre planted explosives rather than the purported narrative of the natural collapses from fire. Was the conspiracy surrounding World Trade Center 7 influenced by the implication that it came down through unnatural means rather than an unbiased investigation? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't actually remember people talking about that a lot in the early days of the truth movement. I, I think the build, the collapse of the building things came just a little bit later. I could be wrong about that. Like That could be just my memory, but it seemed to be, it was like Richard Gage in 2006 that got that ball rolling in a more substantial way. Um, 
And I suppose it is a very visual thing, right? So you almost do need YouTube to really push that conspiracy out there because it is, it's the sight of it. And I think in that, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question here, but what I found interesting was meeting people for whom that video had catapulted them into a different world. It was like an initiation moment where with the collapse of Building 7 came the collapse of their worldview. And I'd, I'd met people, I, I gave an example of one chap in the book, but I've met more than one who described that process and then having to build a new tower um, in its place. And so that was my, uh, with, with a whole different worldview arising out of that, I'm sure there'll be elements I'd agree with, elements i disagree with in that. Um, but it's just, it's, it fascinated me how watching this event and interpreting it a certain way catapults someone into an entirely different reality. It, it just seems that there are two competing narratives at play here, Richard, and that is one is the account from mainstream media, which is the extension of the state, if you will, and those mm. of the more fringe elements of conspiracy theorists. My question to you is, is there more, is there some truth to both or somewhere in the middle? Well, probably not the middle, right? But um, I think, I mean, it's very hard to say what, I, I try to stay away from saying what truth is in the book, right? Because right, right. to me, the world is a very unknown and noble thing. And we can, we can pick up little facets of it and gain insight into one area. But then even there, even, you know, the thing you could write a great thesis on, if you look at it another way, or maybe you're completely wrong, and I'm sure you'd acknowledge, Adam, like, for all your studies of 9-11, I think you'd be surprised if, you know, if you could lift up the veil and see it as it actually was, you'd probably reckon you'd be shocked, right, by what you'd find. You'd say, oh, I never imagined that and then this, and it was all for this reason. You know, you'd probably be quite surprised. So I, I try and stay away from truth claims um, in the book. What I suggest is, with the world being unknowable, we therefore benefit from adopting different perspectives upon it. So it could be the a conspiratorial vision where you have this deep state architecture running even over hundreds of years, looking at it that way, it might not be true, but it might open you up to seeing things that a less conspiratorial vision doesn't. And then it could be also that stepping out of that and seeing, well, no, hang on a minute, it's also the case that events in history are very much a, a product of randomness too, and just whoever happens to be occupying positions of political power at the time and their personalities and what the weather was doing. And, and this, this kind of like spectrum between an extremely ordered account of history and an extremely random account, I would say m both of those forces must be at play. Um, and to be really healthy and balanced, it would be good to step between the two of them and look at various different lenses. Let me ask you a, a, a tough question. And uh, where are we better? Well, this is a hypothetical, but it's, uh, you know, I'll just base on your opinion. Is it better off knowing something or not knowing something? Well, that's very philosophical, Adam. That, that is a difficult it? question. I mean, I would say we, we quest to know things. Okay. Now, like, there could be things that we know that make us uncomfortable. Like if I'd never gone down the conspiracy rabbit hole or the geopolitical rabbit hole, my life would be different, <laughs> right? And arguably better in some ways. Um, but it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not that I would I would want that. I, and as I sit here now, I, I quest for more truth and to know more. So there seems to be some innate good in knowing and expanding knowing even if it would be hard to justify that on paper in terms of what worldly gain did i acquire from this you know? right like but it seems, seems to be a good in and of itself would you say i mean right but, but, you know because this is a question i had from a dear friend of mine nicole who i share like a, a deep common bond when i talk about uh the nature of philosophy and geopolitics and i asked her this question once because she's a, a mother and i said would you rather live in a past, like in a, a shield of ignorance in your past, because we were happier younger, as opposed to getting older and knowing more things, which are far more depressing in the reality of it, in the face of it. And to my surprise, she said that she would, you know, rather be happy and ignorant, and then changed her mind 
later on when I asked that question months later and said, no, she would rather know and try to make the future a better place. And I said, now that's, you know, I, I can understand why she mm. said that. So right? I mean, maybe, maybe the obvious answer is no, no, I'd, I'd rather be happy and ignorant. And then something deeper in the soul calls out, right? And, no, actually, no, I, I need to know reality as it is. Right. There's something. And I have multiple friends who some of them are self-aware enough to know this about themselves that they don't want to know beyond a certain point about governments which are ostensibly protective entities i mean they're, they're the people you're going to if you lose your job and you need an unemployment check or if you um if you get sick in this country or in britain most of europe you're going to a government hospital okay so government takes on the you know when you're a little kid and you graze your knee and go to your mom when you grow up you graze your knee in a worse way you go to the state okay and it's not necessarily a comforting thought to think that they're this big evil okay um and maybe okay what they do outside the house that's one thing what they do in iraq or afghanistan or yemen well okay that's it but you want to think that they really love you in some way if they're going to be providing your welfare and your health care so I can understand that and actually uh, various people that have said that to me they've actually often had children right and they thought okay that's a that's a level of instability i don't need and one of the things i wanted to explore in the book is like i think that's wise for a couple of reasons in some ways because when reality shatters and this is like i think it's chapter seven i talk about this adam right that um it's not easy to shatter your reality because it's when you start falling and falling where do you stop maybe you don't until your feet land firmly upon the flat earth, right? You can just go down a conspiracy rabbit hole and it's very hard to piece reality back together again. And you don't necessarily want to do that when you've got a couple of kids to look after and a job to maintain and something of a social life to occasionally turn up to. Um, I also know people in more public positions, right? Where, or they have to run groups or um, coach people in some manner or support people, right? Or they're adults. And I notice sometimes they've stayed away from a more conspiratorial vision, even when it's put to them. And I do observe that, well, gee, if they adopted this, it would change the nature of what they do. And a lot of people who they are in that supportive role for wouldn't feel comfortable if it was that plus conspiracy theory. Okay. So I do wonder if like there's a, a psychological mechanism. So, because, I mean, I think we've both seen, I was a little bit more, this is more of a newer perspective for me and, and something that prompted a, a fair bit of the book was seeing up close and personal, the destructive, well, not, not actually that personal, but up, up close at a distance, up close at a distance, people I would interact with, but not close to me, um, go for a kind of destructive phase of getting into conspiracy theory where it can almost go into a kind of psychosis, you know? And that was a new one for me. Mostly I was, would be of the, of the mindset of people need to like red pill more, right? They need to shatter their reality more and, uh, expand themselves, but then seeing, and even people I would have a lot of ideological disagreement with, like Mick West, okay, uh, the, what does he do, the uh, Tales from the Rabbit Hole is his book, and I think down, the, or the, yeah, it's book and podcast, um, and I've, I write about him in the last chapter, because I had to come to respect that, okay, one positive function he plays, and I think there are various negative functions, but one positive is he does pull people back from that edge, right, and people who are perhaps losing their minds or have family members losing their minds, staring into the abyss. Um, you need that kind of compassionate figure to, to pull back and say, just calm it down a bit. Uh, you know, the world yeah. may not be as crazy as you think. Sure. I, w I want to talk about Mick West later. I have a question based yeah, on okay. that. Yeah. yeah. But going back to the book, you write about the blurring lines of reality and imagination. And the, um, the example you give is from Philip K. Dick. Mm. who believed he lived in an alternate version of reality, while you also point out that it very well could be his imagination was so powerful, it was overwhelming his own rationale. Mm. And so my question is, how much of a difference is there between the metaphorical and the literal when it comes to the human mind? Well, so I think if there's an overarching point to the book, and this, well, I suppose there's several, but one would be to recommend to people and maybe people not exclusively but maybe slightly more people in spiritual communities to take conspiracies or conspiracy theories theorists seriously if not literally because what i saw arising with um covid particularly okay 
and having been in spiritual communities myself or one in particular, um, I've always known there was a divide there between people who are really conspiratorial and people who are really aren't. Okay. Uh, and that fissure just massively expanded during COVID where there was more kind of hostility. And I'd see people um, wanting to distance themselves from the conspiracy theorists in their midst and write quite dismissive. And I think kind of low quality dismissals. Okay. And yeah. So what I was interested to examine then with, with um, what you're putting there, um, I was looking at the way when we push the metaphorical out of something, it comes back in. Okay. So we, um, what was I saying? Yeah, Philip. So Philip K. Dick was um, a writer. He did, he most famously did Total Recall and uh, The Man in High Castle, which was serialized on Amazon. And I was I was exploring with that the distinct the, the similarity and distinction with um, him and David Icke, right? So why we think David Icke is crazy? So David Icke um, writes this book on reptilians, and they're literal. They're in the world. They're walking around the White House, and he takes the metaphorical world, the symbolic world. And he takes the physical world and he just sticks them together in a way that's very uncomfortable for us. Okay, well, Philip K. Dick uh, sort of does that um, because he will reveal that he believes that his books were based on an actual reality and a reality he has a memory of. But it's a reality that's a little bit distinct. It's on like a different timeline, if you like, to this reality. Um, so that it's a very different reading experience because you can put him safely in the category of fiction. So what I was interested in, even though he's, he's kind of not, what I was interested in is what is the effect of blurring that line when we, when we merge the mythic and the, and the physical. Okay. And to me, um, it seems like you can't just say it's bad. Okay. Obviously it could be bad if you introduce all sorts of, um, kind of crazy notions, uh, into your attempt to understand the world into your politics. Right. But, Mythology obviously plays a role and literalism, taking mythology literally take, plays a role. So Philip K. Dick commented that he only kind of remembered that what he was writing from was memory after the publication of the book. And he was aware that, look, if I'd have come out and said all this stuff beforehand, that would have like really changed the way people read it. And for one thing, I think it would have made it more scary, right? If you thought like the events of the man in the high castle, like Nazis taking over America, it's like, if you put that thought and say, Hey, this, this really happened, you know, and this, this could have happened in an alternative timeline. It did happen. It makes it a bit more, Ooh, chilling. Um, whereas like David Icke, he does blur that line. He said, you know, the, the reptilians are real, they're, 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 they're real entities. And that, then you can't leave it safely in the world of fiction. The, his work affects you. If you take that in and take it in, on any way, seriously, in a way that has this more chilling effect. And in that sense, I think it prompts greater action from a smaller number of people. Okay. So if you think about like, um, I was very interested in the, uh, mythos of Christianity, the idea of Jesus principally being a kind of spiritual initiation myth that got taken literally. And, um, a friend of mine, Tim Freak, who I've interviewed on this topic, he wrote some books on it. Um, he thinks that's, um, you know, a really bad thing that happened that it got taken literally. And it, I suppose he's echoing Joseph Campbell there in saying like, a, a myth dies, it loses all its spiritual um, potential uh, when it gets taken as, as history. Okay. And I wanted to put another side to that and say, well, clearly not right. Cause Christianity has 2 billion adherents and it's been around for 2000 years. So w where's the problem here, right? It's like, it's obviously there's something very powerful in taking your myths literally. And I'm not saying, and therefore we should do this, but we should be aware of that. We should be aware that David Icke, um, for all his reptilians, um, even if they're not, even if he's not describing history accurately, um, he's doing something. It's having an effect on the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people that have come into that, um, come into contact with his work in a way that a John Pilger book wouldn't. And in a way that David Icke's work wouldn't, if he put, this is a work of fiction at the front. And it had that effect on me. It, it shattered my reality, right? So that's, you, you need something big and powerful and kind of crazy to do that. And I think Adam, if you talk to a lot of people who like yourself, maybe are very cynical about consp conspiracy theory and they're doing what they attempt to be very erudite in their geopolitical research, a lot of them, if you ask, how did you get into this then? A lot of them have a crazy story, right? A lot of them like think that, uh, they got into it through, um, Judy Woods energy. I think it's your one, isn't it? Judy Woods energy beams. They saw that crazy idea. And they went, what yeah. is this about? And then at some later point, 
they look back with a little bit of embarrassment on that. They don't want to necessarily want to say, oh yeah, I, I got into it because, you know, I thought the reptiles were real or so, you know, yeah. but it's often like, um, initiations are often kind of crazy and that goes to spirituality too. I noticed you, you speak to people in spiritual groups and, um, they can be doing something, you know, quite serious, quite arduous, like Zazen meditation. You've got to sit with a straight back for an hour a day in the morning, well, however long a day. And, um, you know, it's all about consciousness and they read kind of erudite papers on the, the materialism, idealism debate. But like, how did you get into this then? And it's like, it's often something involving, like they were talking to the fairies at the bottom of the garden. And they don't really want to say that now, but it's often like a crazy thing. So I thought, oh, that's an interesting parallel. So that, that was my point really. we have to be aware of the, the mythic dimension is powerful in the human psyche and it comes into geopolitics. And if you don't acknowledge that you end up just going to crazy town. Cause if, if you exclude it, it, it ends up, you know, coming in in a way that's maybe not ideal. So that, that that's what it's going for there. Sure. Well, you just answered my next question, by the oh, way, right. uh, because I was just going to talk about the, um, because it was my interest uh, initially before Nyland was monotheism specifically. And there was a point, where you raised a book about how the Abrahamic faiths have lost the essence of spirituality by way of literal interpretation. And I was going to ask for your uh, a, de a fuller explanation of it. But well, yeah, I'll, I'll just say on that, Adam, that's going to like, I'm, I'm sort of cautious in the way I say that because I recognize that a lot of people will go, no, they haven't. I'm a, a Christian, a, a Jew, a, a Muslim, and I think they're fall to the brim and overflowing of spirituality. And I'm not really wanting to start that argument, but what I am saying is, look, there is a perspective where like, and I think it's an entirely valid one, where you can say that, um, the, the Jesus story has all these powerful, mythical, symbolical themes to it. And then when you make a story about a man in history, that changes the nature of it, loses that. And that's a very common trope inside, uh, spiritual groups. Okay. And inside mythologists like Joseph Campbell. And I'm just observing the opposite of that, that had Jesus remained a myth, we'd probably never have heard of him because it would have been some obscure cult that, you know, it's the fact that he, unlike a lot of the other gods, he entered history in a profound way. And that gives it a sense of reality that people, if you ever notice how, how important it is to, um, Christians, a lot of them, that Jesus was historical and you think like, why would that be right? Because like people, when they discover that Sesame street isn't real, they don't think mathematics is rubbish. Cause like, oh, but I saw the number nine on TV. So you're telling me that's not the number nine. Well, no, cause like, look, maths exists in some sort of abstract realm. Okay. And it's like more powerful and more real than the physical stuff we're touching in some ways, if you look at it that way. So to say it's like not historical or, or the, the number nine, isn't really a character that appears on Sesame street. doesn't mean math isn't real. And in the same way to say that like, um, the Jesus, uh, Jesus wasn't, if he wasn't, it wasn't an historical character. It doesn't mean that Jesus isn't quote unquote real in some sense. Okay. But we very much equate reality with the stuff you can touch with history. And that takes on a pa sorry, just a noise in the background. Uh, that takes on a power then. Okay. Like, um, and that's what I'm saying about David Icke, that in, in making the reptilians real, his work takes on all this power that it wouldn't otherwise have. It, 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 that chapter really was, when you talked about that, it resonated with me because I, I came from that background. And just to give you a short you know, summary about where I came from in those early years in 2003 and four was that I was an atheist, but then I, I gravitated toward the, what, what's there, they were labeled the new age atheists, like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, hmm. Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins. And so I became a fervent anti-theist and I became very uh, abusive toward people of all faiths because I generalized them as being all the same. Uh, you know, they're all crazy thinking, believing different things. And I was led down this road for like three years. And then I realized that this worldview of mine was detrimental and I was wrong, flat out wrong, because there are different faiths and there are different beliefs and I had to understand them. And in doing so, it was actually an atheist who was actually biblically literate, who told me that, you know, your, 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 your shtick is, you know, getting old, uh, you know, you're abusive and it's uh, not helpful to anybody. And I respected this individual and I was like, what, what did I do wrong? So I self-reflected and I remember getting off the internet for a year to, to self-reflect and saying, why it made it? so wrong about this worldview that I had. And I realized, and it was grudgingly realization too, that Christopher Hitchens was wrong. 
and I really respected him. And not only was he wrong on the uh, religious sense and that I'm still an atheist. I, he, I don't think he's always wrong, but his generalizations and debates toward low hanging fruit, you know, mm. people who take the Bible literally where he would never debate a spiritualist, a real theologian. But it also led me to believe that his views on the real world, because he became a neocon after 9-11, were also wrong. So in the end, it changed me and changed my life for the better, because here I am. Now I had to really study about what I was railing against and what I believe. And so it changed me. It was like it changed everybody in the 9-11 community and skeptic community and truthers and debunkers. We all came from that fringe mentality that you outlined so perfectly in the book. And it, it really is, a, 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 I love the, 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 I'm glad you wrote the book because it's, it really resonates for a lot of people in the truth community, whatever it be 9-11 or anything else, because we've, even for skeptics, because we all came from that essence, that fringe essence. You know, when I first came into 9-11, mm. I, you know, I knew who Judy Wood was. I first film I, I ever saw was In Plain Sight by Dave Von Cleese and Lose Change. And I believed no planes hit the Pentagon. I believed, you know, there was no plane crash Shanksville. But because of that, I then looked at the other point of view because I didn't want to make the same mistakes as I did with my previous uh, thoughts on religion. Mm. So in religion, you have this concept of an initiatory myth. Okay, mm -hmm. that's at least the, the people at the more esoteric end of the spectrum would see the more literal religion, the kind of religion that... Hitchens and Dawkins criticizes mm -hmm. as, oh, yeah, they, they take, they are making the same mistake as the fundamentalist religious types. They, they're thinking that the initiatory myth is the entirety of it. Okay. And what's interesting to me about that period, because I, I kind of hated that whole new atheist period, because I was into a kind of symbolist um, interpretation, understanding of religion. So I, my friend of mine gave me Richard Dawkins' um, book with the kind of here, that'll sort you out kind of thing. And I said, oh, this guy is simplifying everything and he doesn't understand what he doesn't understand. Um, but what's interesting about that period is there were all these predictions. I remember like going back to the 80s, uh, John Shelby Sponge, the, the, the priest, wrote a book um, on Christianity saying, look, this whole kind of very literal taking the Bible, literally Christianity, that's all going to fall away. That's not going to be around 20, 30 years from now. And it's going to be a more kind of secular Christianity based on more kind of humanitarian principles that survives. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. What grew during the period was exactly the kind of religion that Dawkins and Hitchens railed against. It was the extreme literal version. And I think that speaks to the power of myth and the necessity of having myth in, in our lives. And I think that recently you've, you've got figures like Jordan Peterson uh, talking about uh, sort of remythologize the intellectual landscape and has, has reasserted, look, there is an importance to myth. Whatever you make of it, the underpinnings of it, there is an importance to it. Um, and that was in the book, the, the message to conspiracy, uh, sorry, the message to people who do the kind of geopolitical analysis, which they feel that conspiracy theory detracts from, which I don't doubt it does, right? And I talk about how conspiracy theory is weaponized to protect the state, okay, to... Um, whenever like Fox News or MSNBC wants to cover 9-11, they'll get someone on from the very extreme fringe. So they're using a conspiracy to say, oh, look, people who question the state's narrative, wackos, you know, and, and it keeps everyone in the box. So like, I don't doubt they have a negative impact, but my, my point is they're not going away, okay? Because if you, like, nobody, nobody's first book on 9-11 is Peter Dale Scott's The Road to 9-11, okay? Unless you're an extremely unusual person, okay? Um, you're not... You're not reading uh, Kevin Fenton's Disconnecting the Dots as your first book, unless you're already like so involved in this world anyway that you know you're not really an outsider. You're just an outsider to one aspect of it. Um, you, you're going to start with something that's a bit more big and flamboyant, and there's no point in railing against that. There's no point in like waving a fist in the air saying, "Oh, if all, only all these conspiracy people would go away, everyone would, you know, read my 500-page book with 10,000 footnotes." They wouldn't. They couldn't, you know? Um, so the question I leave then is, well, what do you do about that? Okay, you've, you've, there's got to be some kind of, if you think that people should be moving to this, more, what you consider a more erudite understanding, there's got to be some kind of conveyor belt to pick those people up and not just go in with a sledgehammer and start smashing their illusions. Because look, we've seen it in religion. How effective is that? It, it just isn't, okay? So there has to be some way to move people along that spectrum then. 
Um, and that's what you've got to work on, not like smashing these conspiracies because they're, they're, they're not going anywhere for, for a good while. Yeah, because I, I think people tend to gravitate toward more of the imagination and mythology than they do with the reality. Uh, is, by the way, is George W. Bush a shape-shifting reptilian or is delusion where reptilians could possibly exist only? Is George Bush a shape-shifting reptilian? So that's a chapter, chapter heading. That's okay? right. That's right. And what I do is break out of the binary of saying, well, you could say, you could say, yes, he is. Or you could say, and then go down the David Icke road, or you could say, no, he isn't. And that's, that's kind of crazy. But you could also say, as compared to what, right? Because right. right. <laughs> like a lot of people have a lot of ideas of who George W. Bush is. We're talking like millions of people were in a very courtish movement around making him president, yeah. president. Um, and thinking he was going to do all sorts of things like look after their children and um, improve their education and um, make the economy boom and and protect Americans through going to foreign wars and and all sorts and all these things I suggest are like at least as crazy as thinking he's a shape shifting reptilian. So I'm, I'm that's why I'm drawing out this that spectrum there. Right, right. Because isn't it? It's, it's oh, I notice this on the opposite end of the spectrum regarding this chapter is that it res really resonated with me again because. I see the same way, not with just with George Bush, but on the polar opposite end in Barack Obama. He's beloved. He's good looking. Mm, people mm. gravitated toward him. Meanwhile, he's a sociopath. He ended up killing tens of thousands of people, bombed seven Arab countries in less than six years, um, destroyed the union, the car unions in this country, uh, corporatized uh, health care in this country, uh, gave mm. a blank check really to the NSA and uh, helped construct the Utah data center. Um, allowed for a number of civil liberties to be abused and arrested the most whistleblowers in U.S. history. Yet mm. this man is reviled, uh, you know, uh, adorned by millions of people in the light of all this. Yeah. And so is yeah. that that mythology that surrounds is that is that is it more mythology or is it psychosis or a denial of realism? Yeah, I, mean, I know I don't think I super go into this, but I think that the, the state has taken on a religious function. Because when I was young, I used to, mm -hmm. uh, there was this image put around that we live in a post-Christian culture, right? And I remember someone saying, uh, reading a book, and it was just democracy had become like a new religion. And I was like, that's crazy. Democracy is like true. You know, that's not, not a religious thing. Mm -hmm. And later on, I came to see it. I came to see how the state had taken on like the old religious functions where, uh, and it, you see this in the language in the United States now of like on the January 6th yes. riots, yeah. uprising, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. whatever you want to call it. There was a sense of like a sacred chamber had been violated, not an administrative building. Okay. They, they, like the, the, the rioters had, had desecrated um, a, a, a sacred place. And yeah, you saw that massively around the imagery of the bomb and being a kind of savior figure after all the, the terrible years of Bush, maybe more strongly than uh, with other presidents, but took on more for, and, and Trump then, like, wow, did he take on some religious oh, significance for people, yeah. you know, in a, in a different kind of direction. Hmm. There, are, there are many competing agendas within the hierarchical structure of government, for example, the banking institutions, the military industrial complex, fossil fuel industrialists, but they have a, common goal which is affluence power and it's just the manner in which they achieve it which is the which is within debate now would that make sense to what you were trying to relay in the book um i i probably see things that way that there are these different forces pulling on the direction of the government or the state and the direction of travel is the resultant force of all of those. So you might have finance and oil and arms manufacturers, foreign lobbies like Israel and Ukraine currently, all pulling in slightly different directions, slightly different goals. But in a general sense, they want to go west, not east, or east, not west. They've got a, you know, they're not pulling in a diametrically opposed direction with some, uh, contradictions to that sometimes uh, when they are like the Israel lobby and the oil lobby might sometimes be in like real contradiction and um, but a resulting force arises out of that and the ship sails but in relation to the book I would just put that as like one paradigm okay one way of looking at things um amongst like several because you could also have a fact like ideology what role does in one sense like 
everyone's trying to enrich themselves through the state. But in another sense, there are people who have deep ideological commitments. They're trying to live out through the state too. So there, there is different, and which one of those forces predominates? In, in chapter eight, you coined the phrase conspirituality, which you defined the conjunction of conspiracy and spirituality. Uh, tell us more about the meeting and where you got it from. Yeah, it's, it's, um, came about, about 10 years ago and I, I didn't know this until I started writing the book. I'd heard people use it as kind of in a, in a positive connotation and people about my age who probably radicalized by nine 11 and then got into a spiritual thing too, or vice versa. Um, so con spirituality. Um, and then I heard it during the pandemic used as a pejorative term for people involved in spirituality who are corrupted by conspiracism and taken down this dark path. So. It was actually yeah, a paper, um, I'm going to say Charlotte Ward and David Voas, two academics who put the paper together in, uh, and noticed this phenomenon and uh, put it together about 10 years ago. They coined the, they coined the term. Um, so yeah, I was just interested, as I've probably addressed this a bit already, just exploring the, the parallels that exist between spirituality and conspiracy theory. It, but almost like they're a mirror image, right? So they're the opposite of each other, but a mirrored opposite. David Icke was quite an influential entity in your initial endeavors, mm. past and even currently, from frenzied belief to questioning self and rationalizing the conspiracy from the narrative. Uh, your message was clear at the end with Mick West that the truth is somewhere in the middle. What are we looking for, Richard? Hmm. I think we're looking for a way to look, principally. Mm. I think we haven't resolved that, and we, we think we know the way to look, so then we're talking about what we're looking at. And what I want us to do is take a step back and say, well, how are we looking at this? Because I, I had a quote from Mick West where he said, look, the truth isn't in the middle. Like Building 7 either was or wasn't brought down by controlled demolition. There's no, in the middle, it's like nice fluffy thing to say, but it's not real. And I say, okay, maybe on that level, yes. But if you step back from the level of individual incidents to the level of people, then the truth is in the middle. Because someone who holds the, um, like David Chandler, for example, our, our friend, um, he's a, a big, more than, well, more than a believer, he's, he's convinced from his uh, knowledge of physics that Building 7 came down. Let's, for argument's sake, say he's wrong. Okay, David Sandler, still, from holding that worldview, um, I would say has a really in-depth knowledge of a lot of the America's geopolitical history. Okay, so compared to somebody who's um, then right about Building 7, I'm just giving a theoretical right, uh, but doesn't know that, Where, where's the truth? Well, it's clearly somewhere in the middle, right? So on the level of people, truth doesn't reside in a particular person. It is, I would suggest, somewhere in the middle. And, and with that in mind, we can start to have a, a more productive dialogue. But even, even the wing nut at the end of the spectrum who thinks the world's flat and the wing nut at the other end of the spectrum who thinks that Rachel Maddow is worth listening to, um, all of these people have some level of truth <laughs> right. or some level well, of value. Well, some level, right, at some level of value. And, uh, well, Richard, what what are your what are you working on now currently? Um, relevant to this, I'm actually doing a series on David Icke. On um, mm -hmm. I'm reading. It's called Reading David Icke because I am reading David Icke. I'm reading him from beginning to end. I've just done the third episode, and I think this is I'm finding psychotherapeutic for me, Adam, to kind of undercover, uncover my own past in terms of like reading his books, not knowing what to make of them 20 years later, still not knowing what to make of him. So I'm trying to answer the question. I'm trying to understand David Icke really, um, because I'm interested in iconoclasts and this is an iconoclast that touched my life and my thinking. So how did somebody who was, and I think Americans don't know this, but David Icke was massively famous in the UK uh, prior to any of his more recent shenanigans with conspiracy uh, as a sports presenter. So how does, how does a goalkeeper become a sports presenter? become an environmentalist, well, that's not too hard a journey to make, but how does this guy go on TV and start talking about earthquakes and, and all the rest? And he's got, he's on a mission from the spirit realm to, to kind of save the world. How does this Messiah complex come about? Okay. And then how does this guy who's getting these spiritual messages, um, about humanity and telling us all we're one consciousness and all the rest, how does he become a conspiracy theorist? Okay. What, what, what shifted there? And that's the episode I've just done. And then, um, I'm going on to look at how the reptiles come into interview and the more outrageous of his positions. And my hope, uh, certainly not all the audience will agree, um, but if you can see the world through David Icke's eyes, you can understand maybe 
that he has a certain psychological uh, disposition, certain traits, certain um, traits that might be heightened. Like he's a really, he really goes for it when he does something. When you dive in, when he thinks he's got the answer, he goes for it. And if you understand the time he was writing, it was pre-internet, and if you understand uh, the kind of information that he was coming across, the, the, the listener can go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see how he got himself there. Now, I wouldn't do it, but I can see how, at this point, he's not, like, gone bananas. He's still, like, he's a very unusual human being who's done a lot of good and a lot of bad, maybe. Um, but he's... he's um, yeah, I can understand him. He's not a complete mystery why this guy is ranting about reptilians anymore. That's my goal. Don't know if I'll get there with the reptilians. Seems like a tall order, but I've gotten, I've just done the episode explaining how he became a, a conspiracy theorist. And I think that for me, it was it was really, yeah, I suppose therapeutic. Because, oh yeah, I can see what he got right. And I can also see where I feel he, he went wrong. So yeah, that's what I'm working on amongst other things that's that's relevant to to this. Richard Cox, his book is Contemplating Conspiracy, Excursions into Undiluted Madness, which could, be, which could be found on Amazon. Thank you very much for coming on, Richard. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the interview, Adam. It's, it's yeah, wonderful. Thank you.